Um, my first time before you for this course, Billy Mallon, I'm uh, like many of the others who have gone and some who are yet to come. I'm from the Residency Director Graveyard Program. So um, the, many of the speakers here who uh, have been before you have spent substantial time in residence education. And one of the things that comes with that is you see exams, you know what the in information drift is, you deal with questions and question writing and things like that all the time. So there's, you know, you sort of understand the difference between education for professional sake and education for exam sake. Um, studying to the test or teaching to the test, lots of people want to talk about that like it's really low brow, that you shouldn't do that. You know, aren't we professional enough to learn the things we need for our skills and our craft? Uh, no, we're going to teach to the test. Um, in fact, this morning, I'm going to do the next two hours of talks with you. Toxicology, you know, the clinical reality of toxicology is totally at odds with the testing reality. Many of you here are sitting there thinking, I'm not a toxicologist. I don't remember all this stuff. I knew it maybe when I was a resident. And now they're going to ask me questions about this stuff. And, you know, when I have a patient who's got this, you know, I call somebody. I phone a friend. I call the poison center. They'll tell me what to do. I don't need to know this. You know, and the other clinical reality of toxicology is, while some people certainly die of drug overdoses, they successfully complete a suicide attempt, the vast majority of drug overdoses that arrive in the emergency room are going to live if you do almost nothing besides supportive care. So the mortality of an overdose presenting to the emergency room is under 1%. That means 99% are going to do fine with supportive care. Of the 1% who die, you could be the best toxicologist in the world and you'd only be able to save maybe a third of them because the drugs had a head start. So if you're the greatest toxicologist in the world, know every antidote and every specific thing to do, if the drugs have too big of a head start, you can't undo it. And so you have this clinical reality that about a third or a half of a percent of people could be saved by a toxicologist. And that's why some people have proposed that we really only need one poison center in the country with an 800 number, with some really smart toxicologists at it to help you. Certainly state by state is enough. All right, so that's the clinical reality. The testing reality is there's a lot of biz buzz and a lot of memorization and some pharmacology. And trust me, in this manual is more than what you would need to get most of the questions, if not all of the questions you'd be facing correct. So that's why we're here, is to brush up on stuff in a focused way, because we got, I'm, by the way, I'm in the boat. I'm reserting this year. Some of my classmates are here. They're going just like they should be, the organized, prepared classmates. They're here now. My other classmates will be here, you know, two weeks before the test for that one. But there you go. So let's get started. Tox. Some principles of toxicology. The first part of this lecture is the general with the toxidromes. The middle part of the lecture is going to be an alphabetic waltz through everything you can think of that might be relevant, not everything, but a sort of a focused waltz. And then the last part is, is mnemonic heaven. We're not going to do the mnemonic heaven except for a couple of selected things, but they're there. If you're a mnemonic type of learner and you want ways to memorize this stuff, there's some stuff there. Principles. This is the basic stuff. Reduce exposure, reduce absorption. Sometimes there's decontamination stuff you need to do. Increase elimination. Know when to intervene and what for. Give good supportive care. Well, from what I just told you, giving good supportive care, that'll save 99 plus percent of overdoses. And then give specific therapy when, an an when there is an antidote that works. And so that's where you're getting anxious right now, thinking about an exam coming. I don't know all the antidotes and how they work and what to give and how to identify them. And so that's what we're going to work through. The coma cocktail, dextrose, Narcan, thymine, flumazenil, it's got a no after it. And the reason it's got a no after it is, is that if someone's a benzo overdose, remember, no one ever dies of a benzo overdose unless they choke to death on the pills. Because as you take benzos, you get sleepier and then you stop. Same thing's true with alcohol. It's a set of hypnotic. You keep drinking, drinking. If you get really drunk, you stop drinking because you fall down drunk. So you have to really chug the bottle of vodka or really massively do it with the benzos to get there, and most of the time they don't do it that way. Now, having noted that, if someone is a benzo overdose, you've got to worry that they're a chronic benzo abuser. And hard reversing them with flumazenil would replace a non-lethal overdose 
with a lethal withdrawal syndrome, right? Set of hypnotic withdrawal syndromes are potentially lethal. Alcohol withdrawal can kill you. Hard benzo withdrawal can kill you. So giving a benzo overdose flumazenil is a little bit dicey. You could be rewarded with status epilepticus and things that you can't, are going to be much more difficult to manage. So that's why it says no there. Now, having noted that, if you had a two-year-old who inadvertently got into mom's Valiums and, you know, did 20 milligrams of Valium or something like that, you might use, I'm pretty confident that two-year-old's not yet a chronic abuser of benzos. That one you could reverse. It's not because it doesn't work. And there's the flumazenil. And a lot of people say that even in, in sort of a chronic benzo thing, you know, if we wanted to get into the specifics, some people say you can walk in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, a little bit at a time, especially if you're at the point where someone was hypotensive or about to be intubated. But generally the answer on the exams is no. Don't forget to find the D50. Remember that people who are hypoglycemic, and I, I love hypoglycemia and hypokalemia because you'd think that there's, you know, that you should, if you're hypokalemic, you should have global weakness. If you're hypoglycemic, you should have, you know, global whole body things. But the reality is when you look at those is that these patients are frequently focal. They're excellent stroke mimics. So I don't know why your right lower extremity would become, you know, particularly weak when you're hypokalemic, but it might. And I don't know why you might have focal findings when you're hypoglycemic, but many of us, probably almost everyone in the room here has seen somebody with them. So remember that just because they're, they're focal doesn't mean it's not low sugar. Keep checking. These are some drugs that are associated with hypoglycemia. Salicylates, acetaminophen, insulin, alcohol, and oral hypoglycemics. And why do they put this list here? Not so you would memorize the list, but so you would think, check a glucose on everyone, right? Sort of like a pregnancy test, 8 to 80, check it, so you're not surprised. All right, decontamination. There's been a lot made of this, and many people in the room, because I see some gray hairs and no hairs out there, um, have gone through this thing where we charcoal people, we made them puke, we charcoal, we lavage them, charcoal them, lavage them. You know, we, we, you know you're turning the whole uh, patient care suite into a Dalmatian, you know, from the person barfing charcoal. You know, we've made a mess of this. So let's get some of the common sense stuff down. The vast majority of patients are unlikely to benefit from gastric decontamination because the drugs have a head start. They're not in the stomach anymore. Alcohol is a classic example. If you were to drink a huge, you know, half a bottle of vodka in 10 to 15 minutes, that's out of your stomach. It's in your system already. So emptying the stomach won't help. Secondarily, if you eat a Diefenbachia on your way out of here, one of these plants in the hotel, I can try and put a tube down, but it's hard to get leaves out through a tube. So it's not going to work. So, and then finally, there's the group of people who have ingested non-toxic substances or non-toxic amounts. So there you go. Or they're too late. As I said, that's the majority. All right. Who might benefit? Someone who has a bad overdose who says, and we get these every once in a while, it was taking them too long to see me, so I took all my pills like they're punishing you. Okay, what were your pills? And then you find out, you know. By the way, in terms of the history in, in, in toxicology, it's fascinating. The, the literature on this topic is, is kind of all over the dartboard, but if I could summarize it, it would say this. Um, overdosing patients are generally speaking liars. About half of them don't tell the truth about what they took. Well, that means half of them still did. Of the ones who didn't tell the truth about what they took, they're also, they lie in both directions. Half of them overstate what they took, and half of them understate or omit things they took, which is why you should always be worried about a salicylate level and a Tylenol level so that you don't miss those because they're treatable. Anyway, who else might benefit? They had a delayed release product. They have a type of overdose where they might be asymptomatic, um, uh, late, but they have some symptoms before full absorption occurs. So there are a few of those. We'll talk about those. No prospective studies. That's actually not true anymore. There was one study, but it doesn't really have a lot of internal validity. In Sri Lanka, where they tend to overdose on uh, oleander seeds and tea, and they don't have any digibind, they proved that decontamination and charcoal save lives. So that's the first paper ever in the history of tox. Which takes me to another comment about tox. There's no literature on tox. You can't do 
a controlled prospective trial because it's not ethical. And you can't do it on animals because animals have different metabolic pathways. And so there's no real good stuff. So basically one of the comments about toxins is that the whole toxicology world is one big series of case reports. There's a little more to it than that, but there you go. Ipecac, dead. We used to do this stuff. Remember this? You'd give them Ipecac and they would puke for like seven hours. You know, everything you put down that you thought was therapeutic, they'd puke back up. And so they've generally gone away from Ipecac uh, for many limitations, not recommended in the emergency departments, possibly a role, a role if you are like out in the middle of nowhere, you know, east somewhere, um, you know, 500 miles from the nearest, um, you might use it. And what are specific contraindications to it, other than the fact that you don't want them puking for the next, you know, half a day? Caustics, low viscosity hydrocarbons, because you don't want them to inhale them as they vomit them. Uh, bleeding disorders, seizures, low age, altered mental status are specifics. But generally, the, the concept of Ipecac is dead. If that was a choice on an exam question, I'd be looking for something else. And lavage, not uh, commonly used now. I remember the days when we used to charcoal lavage charcoal for bad stuff and things like that. What are the indications? Recent, less than an hour prior, life-threatening ingestion, and the agents are not bound by charcoal. We'll be looking at one of those mnemonics. And the method is a large bore, you know, the E-walled tube, large bore orogastric tube, left lateral decubitus to position, protect the airway, flush it in, flush it out, using that little stopcock dealio and hope you get pills up. Um, Contraindications, the airway's not protected, again, caustics, non-toxic agents, hydrocarbons, again, because you're worried they're going to inhale them as they come up, because they're volatile. And complications, aspiration, esophageal tears, and I don't know how it didn't make it onto the list here, but bleeding noses. I mean, how, for those of you who remember the days of jamming Ewalds down as one of those forms of this will serve them right. It was sort of like emergency medicine street justice. There was always one nurse willing to, I'll put that down. They won't be coming back here again. I'll, try. I'll get to you all. You know, there was that kind of attitude. <coughs> By the way, that's been looked at about um, a half to two thirds of the patients for which the, you know, we felt that that was something that was happapping, the teachable moment emphasized by the e well, they don't remember it because they're, you know, they're altered, they got a drug overdose. And you can see here a problem that the pills aren't going to come up all that well. The little round ones might, but the, you know, the oblong ones aren't going to make it out that tube most of the time. Okay, charcoal. One to two grams per kilo. And there's, you know, there's the super activated charcoal and the activated charcoal. You're basically counting on the surface area of the charcoal to mop up drug if it's there. The optimal ratio of charcoal to toxin is 10 to 1. That means you need loads of charcoal. That means it's, it's, you know, it's a seven-course tasting meal of charcoal. For the amuse-bouche, charcoal. For the appetizer, we have charcoal with foie gras. You know, and it's going to go on like that for all seven courses. It's charcoal, charcoal. The problem is you've got to be careful if you give that much charcoal, particularly if you're given charcoal with sorbitol or some other laxative, because you can um, <clears throat> get into a problem where the laxative part of it is causing... Um, complications. So it does enhance elimination, direct binding, any drug with enterohepatic circulation like theophylline, that's like the poster child for multi-dose activated charcoal because you're going to get that gut dialysis effect. What's poorly bound to charcoal? Lithium, iron, caustic, cyanide, hydrocarbons, alcohol, alkaline acid. We got the mnemonic later for you. Contraindications to, ca <clears throat> to activated charcoal, you got an ileus, that won't work because it's hard to get gut dialysis if gut no move. Um, caustics, because you don't want to reburn things uh, and they don't get bound well, and if they're obstructed. <clears throat> when should you do multi-dose charcoal and really make you sure you're doing more than a single dose is sustained release, Theo, as I said, phenobarb, salicylates, and Tegretol. Tegretol, because Tegretol is one of these weird drugs that has... Um, a fair amount of fecal elimination. There aren't many, you know, usually when we talk about elimination, we're talking about is it conjugated in the liver, is it filtered in the kidney, you know, it's liver kidney, liver kidney, you do that kind of thing. There aren't that many drugs that have great fecal elimination, but uh, Tegretol would be one of them. And then, as I said, avoid the multi-dose cathartics because you can get dehydration, electrolyte problems, and crampy abdominal pain if you give too much of it. 
There's the charcoal. Here it's seen in a bedpan, and sometimes you're going to give enough of it till it comes out in the bedpan. Um, on our jail ward, we used to have these body packers, right? Packers and stuffers, not the same thing. The packers are the ones that are involved in the import-export industry. So that, you know, they've taken something to slow their GI tract down, like Lamotal. They get on the plane wherever they are in Bogota or whatnot. Then they fly into Los Angeles planning to have a, you know, a, a, a light lunch of mag citrate after arrival where they will then produce all of their packets that are in their GI tract for sale. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I, we used to love it when they got found, because when they found them at LAX, they brought them to our hospital. And of course, chain of custody was all important. So you'd give the sorbitol and the charcoal and you'd hear this patient <laughs> and you'd go to the deputies. Sounds like evidence. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> and they, they would have to go through it. You'd like that. That was always fun. All right. <clears throat> also for drug elimination, what else can you do? There's charcoal hemoperfusion. Um, for some drugs, that if you're having trouble with them, like theophylline, phenobarb, and tegretol, again, why would you go to charcoal hemoperfusion? Because they're protein-bound and have huge volumes of distribution. Whole bowel irrigation, this is one of those special things. No order will make you less popular than with your nursing staff than this, particularly if there's no bed available. Because it's put an NG tube in, start the polyethylene glycol electrolyte balance solution through the NG tube, and continue until it's coming out the same color it's going in, aka clear. So, and what you're trying to do is eliminate drugs that are either bound to the GI tract wall. Iron sort of does that, it sticks to the stomach wall or sticks in the intestines. Lithium, uh, Packers again, lead. If they have pica, they got an x ray where they're all full of paint chips. Um, you might want to flush that out so they don't absorb more lead. And the contraindications, again, ileus and obstruction. Yeah, has there ever been a more inappropriately named substance than go lightly? You know, that's uh, if, if, false advertising? Yes, I think so. Go lightly. Yeah, you will do anything but. Last year when I was here, I had, I had crashed a motorcycle and it had some fractures and you know, I was on the dilaudid drip, and I was kind of playing it like a like some musical instrument, ding, 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 because it hurt a lot. And then I got out, and I was on some perks. And after about five days at home, I, I sort of had that mm, that distended feeling. And I realized, how many days has it been? And they had me on the colace and all that stuff. And you realize what the what the pain management people, I you know, I'd heard them say this before but it had never really dawned on me with the same clarity where they say, you know, colace is, you know, mush, no push. And I realized I needed some push. So I tried the roughage thing for one more day, and then I was like, where's the mag citrate? And that, that did it. That did it. You know, you go from above when you can, and it'll get stuff out. All right, more drug elimination. Avoid urine acidification. So that's an old thing, and some of you probably remember. I certainly remember when we used to give vitamin C to our PCP overdoses and things like that. I have no idea what we were doing, neither did they. Now we realize that's not going to work so well. Forced diuresis is almost always the wrong answer. It's not the same thing. A lot of people think when you're giving bicarb, and you might be giving Lasix to someone with, with uh, generally it's bicarb alone though, and trying to get the urine pH up in a salicylate, that's ion trapping, not forced diuresis. So be clear about that. You might be given fluid challenges with it, but it's all about ion trapping. Forced diuresis is almost always the wrong answer. Um, when do you want to alkalinize for salicylates, phenobarb, and INH? You need the urine pH to be 7.5 to 8. It's often hard to get the urine pH up to 7.5 or 8. Remember, most urine pH is acidic. 6 is pretty typical. Um, but so what happens is, is you're giving bicarb, but the pH of the urine is not coming up. And that's because you want the HCO3 minus part of the bicarb to go into the urine, and there's not enough pluses to go with it because you can't pee electricity. So if you want the HCO3 minuses to get in the urine, then you've got to replete potassium and magnesium because you need some cations to go with that stuff into the urine. And so hypokalemia is the most common reason why you can't alkalinize the urine, and sometimes hypomagnesemia too. <clears throat> All right, hemodialysis, when would you do that? Here's a bunch of drugs listed here. There are lots more than that list. But what are you looking for specifically if you want to dialyze someone? You'd like something to have not very much protein binding, because dialysis can't remove stuff from proteins. 
You'd like it to have a low molecular weight and a small volume of distribution. In other words, you'd like it to be basically in the water of your blood. That would be good. If it was in the water, then the dialysis would remove it with the water. All right, these two slides are sort of money slides. They are biz buzz. If you were going to look at one thing sort of before you went into an exam from this whole lecture, it's these two slides because you'd like to remember the antidotes where they exist because most of the rest of tox is supportive care and common sense. So here you go. And I'm not going to go through them all. We're going to talk about each of these agents as we go through the chapter. But there it is, 21 and 22. These are the list of the, of the drug and the antidote. And you kind of got to work your way through these. You know, if you were going to, you know, say, what am I going to look at the night before the exam? This would be pretty high yield if you wanted to get a few tox questions right. All right, some formulas. You know, the anion gap, and we all know mud piles, so I'm not going to go through it. There it is. But I will point out <clears throat> that when you look at mud piles, um, notice that it's iron, INH, not isopropyl. People just stumble on that left, right, and center. The I is not isopropyl alcohol. It's iron and INH. Osmolar gap. Remember the normal osmolarity of your serum is like 285, 290. It might get as high as 300. And it's twice the sodium plus the BUN over 2.8 plus the glucose over 18 plus the alcohol over 4.6. Some people use 5 for the alcohol. Some people use 4. This is all about the molecular weights. When do you have an increased osmolar gap? This is a pretty important slide because they like this. They feel like it's a little more sophisticated than mud piles. So increased gap, yes, now it's isopropyl, acetone, methanol, ethylene glycol. So all the alcohol, see them in there, hanging out there? And alcohol is, should be on the list, except you already add alcohol in the calculation. If you didn't add alcohol in the calculation, then alcohol's in the increased osmolar gap. <clears throat> Mannitol, ketoacidosis, and ethanol, most common. All right, tox screens, largely useless, right? You, you know, <clears throat> here, I can tell you, I took call for the poison center in Los Angeles. I was bites and stings call. I like the bites and stings. But I also took regular call, and I had real toxicologists back me up because I'm not toxicology trained. Um, but I had a, a real tox interest for a while. Anyway, so we took call, and I can just tell you that more mistreatment of overdoses occurs because of tox screens than appropriate treatment. And that's because when people get quantitative screens, they don't know how to interpret them in the setting of the overdose they have, or they get qualitative screens and they believe that they're what the problem is based on the qualitative screen. So tox screens have a high false positive and false negative rate on the, on the urine ones for drugs of abuse. It's pretty hard to fire someone for that unless you write it into the contract when you hire them. It's pretty hard because they won't stand up. One of my favorite studies ever was they called the, the three biggest tox labs, and we're talking the tox labs with gas chromatography, mass spec, they can do everything, you know. They should be able to tell you anything you send them. And they said, all right, we're sending you 20 unloans. And they said, oh, good, good, we love unknowns. Let us show you how, we're badass chemists, let us show it to you. So they sent them 20 unknowns, and they went 20 for 20, all three labs. What they didn't tell them, the bad part of the study was, they didn't tell them, in the next six months, we're sending you 20 unknowns, we're just not telling you when and they batted about 60% on those. So even the best labs in the country don't do well. Urine dipsticks, these urine ones, not so great. Urine screens are for drugs of abuse, and a positive or negative screen doesn't rule out or rule in. They have too high a false positive or false negative rate. What are some false positives? Amphetamines will be false positive with pseudoephedrine. TCAs will be positive with cyclobenzaprine, which is flexural. Remember, a bad flexural overdose looks just like a TCA. That's why I don't give my depressed low back pain patients more than 10 of those puppies. Because if they go home, they, you know, they, they can take the muscle relaxants without having a problem. But if they take too many of the flexorils, they can be in serious trouble. Um, carbamazepine, phenothiazines, diphenhydramine all can give you false positives for TCA. And for PCP, ketamine and dextromethorphan both give you. Um, and it's interesting, dextromethorphan not only gives you a false positive on the screen, 
but a fully dextromethorphaned up, someone who got bad ecstasy and got dextromethorphan, they look like they're on PCP. They're hallucinating and weird and ragged. Um, so dextromethorphan is both false positive on the screen and false positive on the clinical for PCP. False negatives, dilute urine, methadone, um, uh, opiate screens, MDMA, um, uh, you know, is false um, negative for amphetamine, oftentimes. Rohypnol is false negative for benzos. Fentanyl is false negative for opiates as well. That's why fentanyl is a drug of abuse among medical people who might be on a diversion program hoping not to get caught. They're going to use the fentanyl, the China White, because it's false, you know, it's negative on a drug screen. So there you go. Drug levels, the quantitative screens, are also problematic because a lot of people want to interpret them as an acute drug overdose when in fact it's chronic. So it, the classic example of this is salicylates. You get a salicylate level of 50, but it's a chronic salicylate overdose. A level of 50 and that might be lethal, even though the dialysis threshold is 80, 90, 100. 50 might be lethal if it's chronic. So. Lithium, another example where chronic overdoses are very different from acute. In acute overdose, lithium levels are pretty reliable, but in chronic, not so much.